It's Tuesday, May 24th, 2022. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, everything you need to know about monkeypox. What is it? How is it spread? And how concerned should we be? Plus, Boeing's Starliner spacecraft is returning to Earth on Wednesday after just a few hiccups on its first successful trip to the ISS. And Coca-Cola is introducing new bottle caps that you can't remove from the bottle. Here's some cool stuff for your ride home. I've been avoiding talking about this one because it feels a little bit like it's being blown out of proportion and I didn't want to contribute to that, but I think it is time. And at the very least, I can help spread some facts and some analysis from experts on whether or not we should actually be concerned. I am talking, of course, about monkeypox. So as of recording, there have been over 160 cases of monkeypox reported across 16 countries, mostly in Europe, but also in Australia, Canada, the U.S., and Israel. No deaths have yet been reported from these cases. And the data science initiative Global.Health has a Google Sheet case tracker going that I will link to in the show notes if you were curious about keeping up to date. Monkeypox is from the same genus of viruses as smallpox. It causes flu-like symptoms, usually including fever, headache, muscle aches, and swollen lymph nodes, as well as a rash that can turn into fluid-filled blisters that last for about two weeks. Some say that it is more mild than smallpox. It can be deadly, but that's quite rare. Quoting Vox, monkeypox viruses generally circulate among wild animals in Central and West Africa, and usually spread to people when they eat or have other close contact with infected animals. The virus was first identified among research animals at the CDC in the 1950s, that's how it got its name monkeypox, and for a long time afterward, human infections were sporadic, even in countries where a lot of animals were infected. That is partly because monkeypox is related to the smallpox virus, and immunity to smallpox is protective against monkeypox. But as of 1980, smallpox has been eradicated in humans, and vaccinations against smallpox have grown rare, and human cases of monkeypox have been on the rise. According to the CDC, Nigeria has reported 450 cases since 2017, when public health authorities began seeing more cases among humans." End quote. Monkeypox has been seen in the U.S. before. Single cases crop up on occasion when people return from West or Central Africa. And in 2003, there was an outbreak caused by prairie dogs bought as pets in several Midwestern U.S. states. The dogs had gotten it from rats and squirrels who had been shipped from Ghana to Illinois. 47 humans caught monkeypox from the prairie dogs, but each one of them recovered and none of them spread it to any other humans. Monkeypox does have quite a low r naught, that is the average number of people who could contract a contagious disease from someone infected with it. The r naught of monkeypox is between 1 and 2. Although talking to Jay Hooper of the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, NPR reported that, quote, up until this current outbreak, a person sick with monkeypox spread the virus to between 0 and 1 person on average. So all previous outbreaks, up until now, burned themselves out quickly. End quote. And again, while death is possible, it's rare, especially this version of it, and especially in high income nations where people have access to well resourced health care. And even in rural parts of Africa where hospital care is less accessible and has fewer resources, infection has only led to death in 4% of people, according to Vox. But the situation is a little bit different this go round. Dr. Agam Rowe, a medical officer at the CDC, said, quote, What we're facing right now seems to be at least a subset of cases that don't have any history of travel to one of those countries in Africa where the monkeypox virus naturally occurs, and also don't report any exposure to someone who has been diagnosed with monkeypox. So what we're seeing right now is unusual. And she further added, quote, We've never had a situation where so many cases have occurred outside of those countries concurrently. End quote. The cases are mostly linked, however, many in Europe have been linked to a sauna in Spain, a fetish festival in Belgium, and a pride event in the Canary Islands. 
Human-to-human -human transmission happens through close contact with infected people sneezing or coughing or coming into contact with pus from the lesions that the virus causes. According to Vox, scientists are currently working to sequence the viruses isolated from individual patients to determine if anything has changed that might be making it more transmissible or different in other ways. So far, the current outbreak appears to be of the West African clade as opposed to the Congo Basin clade, the two main strains of monkeypox. And this is good news because the West African version is less deadly, less transmissible, and responds better to treatment. And even though public health officials are cautiously sounding the alarm and working diligently to learn more, we probably don't need to be freaking out. You know, I feel like this is one of those things that before 2020, we would have all been like, it's no big deal. The media's blowing it out of proportion. But now our reactions are often more like, oh, great, another terrible thing that is absolutely going to happen. Like COVID-19 turned into an actual pandemic, even when so many people thought it would blow over. So now we're primed to fear subsequent pandemics instead of doubting them. Which, I mean, from a public health funding standpoint is probably a good thing, but not so great for the general public's mental health. But apart from the small number of cases and low transmissibility as compared to COVID-19, here's another point to keep in mind. We're already familiar with monkeypox. Tools already exist for prevention and treatment. We're not flying blind like we were at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, not to mention, that pandemic has gotten people a lot more accustomed to taking preventative measures. And monkeypox is not thought to be transmissible before symptoms appear, which I've long thought to be one of the most frustrating complications of COVID-19. It's made it so easy for people to say, I don't feel sick, so I'm okay going to this large indoor event without a mask, even though they could already be contagious. I mean, can you imagine how much about this pandemic could have been a little less complicated if there weren't asymptomatic cases and you could only spread it once you were already coughing or something? Anyways, we've got that advantage on our side when it comes to monkeypox, at least. Thomas House, a professor of mathematical sciences who works on COVID modeling, tweeted last week, quote, The scenario to fear is not a global pandemic like for coronaviruses or influenza, but rather something like the 2014 Ebola outbreak that caused disruption and death for a long time and is arguably ongoing, but without infection of a large percentage of the population, end quote. And as Bill Hanaj, associate professor at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, explained on Twitter, even though the percentage of populations that could be infected may be lower, we should still be treating infections with the utmost seriousness. He tweeted further, quote, we have unconnected infections in the UK, Portugal, Spain, and Canada. This means community transmission unobserved. It's very plausible that transmission has been happening for some time unnoticed because folks don't expect to see monkeypox and so don't diagnose it. You hear hoofbeats, you expect horses, not unicorns. You see lesions, you don't expect monkeypox and assume it's something else. Now, on the bright side, this implies that the severity of infections are not extremely high, or we would have noticed sooner. On the gloomier, it means there are multiple transmission chains out there already. That means lots of infections, and as we should have learned from recent experience, even if an infection is mostly mild, that is scant comfort if you get so many of them, the rare poor outcomes add up. Lots of questions are unanswered about transmission route and severity. One thing worth remembering, we expect cross-protection against monkeypox from smallpox vaccination. But younger people are not vaccinated, and immunity has been waning in older people for decades. So it is really good that the UK is immunizing close contacts of known cases with a smallpox vaccine. Such ring vaccination strategies have been shown to be valuable in the past and are a sensible use of limited vaccine stocks, end quote. And yes, a few nations have begun vaccinating close contacts, which the CDC says they will establish guidelines for if a full-on outbreak occurs here in the U.S. As Hanange and Vox alluded to, one of the great ironies is that monkeypox cases have been on the rise in recent years because smallpox was eradicated, and therefore less people are vaccinated for it already. The U.S. stopped vaccinating the public en masse against smallpox in 1972. But the vaccines are still out there, and some have been shown to be 85% effective at preventing monkeypox specifically. I want to touch on transmission again, though. 
As I mentioned, many of the cases in Europe have been linked to a fetish festival, a sauna, and a pride celebration. You've likely seen people sounding the alarm about men who have sex with men needing to be particularly cautious. That is all currently true, but it's not the whole story. And we do a disservice to everyone if we act like it is. First, as Maria Van Kerkhove from the WHO said in an interview with STAT, we may be seeing over-reporting from these populations. Because the first few cases were found when patients went to sexual health clinics, national public health agencies reached out to other sexual health clinics, telling them to be on the lookout for monkeypox symptoms. But other healthcare providers, like dermatologists and general practitioners, should also be on the lookout. As Van Kerkhove put it, quote, we're finding where we're looking, end quote. And then Dr. Rao from the CDC explained that rather than being sexually transmitted, it's likely that at the present moment, we're just seeing an overrepresentation of this population due to skin to skin contact within a tight knit community. You can almost think of these as super spreader events. There's a correlation, but not exclusive causation. And as Andy Seal, an advisor with the WHO's HIV, Hepatitis, and STIs program, put it, quote, Many diseases can be spread through sexual contact. You can get a cough or a cold through sexual contact, but it doesn't mean that it's a sexually transmitted disease, end quote. And indeed, making the mistake that the current outbreak of monkeypox could only be spread through sexual encounters, particularly those between men, could leave a lot of people thinking they're safe in situations in which they may not be. Plus, as Matthew Cavanaugh, the deputy executive director of UN AIDS, said in a statement, quote, Stigma and blame undermine trust and capacity to respond effectively during outbreaks like this one. Experience shows that stigmatizing rhetoric can quickly disable evidence-based response by stoking cycles of fear, driving people away from health services, impeding efforts to identify cases, and encouraging ineffective, punitive measures, end quote. And quoting the outlet Them, Blaming anyone for the spread of something like monkeypox, especially blaming the gay community or gay behavior, is not sound public health. Viruses, after all, don't discriminate, and when we do, we only create a better environment to facilitate their spread." End quote. The one slight silver lining here, if we really want to strain for some optimism, is that LGBTQ plus healthcare centers and communities, for historically obvious reasons, are well equipped to test, trace, and take preventative measures to stop the spread of disease. Most LGBTQ plus individuals get tested for sexually transmitted diseases and infections more often than their cisgender or heterosexual counterparts, and are more accustomed to having open dialogues with partners about safe practices. John Brooks, the leader of the CDC's epidemiology research team, noted that they are already working with LGBTQ plus community affiliated organizations on outreach ahead of Pride Month celebrations. So monkeypox may not be sexually transmitted or restricted to LGBTQ plus individuals, but once again, LGBTQ plus organizations may be the ones leading the way to help keep everyone safe. And I also feel a little twinge of discomfort that not only is this disease currently being associated with men who have sex with men, but it also has to be called monkeypox. I mean, come on, there is just too much weight to that, you know, hearkening to racist and homophobic stereotypes about AIDS. It is just really unfortunate right now. And I've been surprised that I haven't seen any more formal terms for monkeypox anywhere. It is technically one of several orthopox viruses, which also includes smallpox and cowpox, but for now, even the CDC and the WHO are just calling it monkeypox. Now, bearing that in mind, to end with a bit of levity, I really appreciated this humor piece from USA Today, written by a monkey and addressed to the rude humans of the world. Bongo, the senior spokes monkey for the Global Foundation for Monkey Brand Management, wrote, quote, We acknowledge the virus was first identified in us, but the first human case didn't show up until 1970, and respected publications like Scientific American now note that the virus did not jump from monkeys to humans, nor are monkeys major carriers of the disease. So why is our freaking name on the virus? This would be like one of us catching a flu that a human named Steve also happened to have, and then howling our heads off about an outbreak of Steve flu in the monkey community. Steve would not be pleased and neither are we, end quote. 
So maybe we'll get a better name for it going forward, even though it's been around forever and under this name. But the main takeaways for now are to remain vigilant and stay informed, but there is no need to freak out about a COVID-19 scale pandemic of monkeypox. You know, there are a few things that are true about this show. Number one is that we technically started as a coronavirus news podcast, so a big deep dive on another spreading virus is absolutely in line with the roots of this show. And number two, once the novel coronavirus became something most people did not want to hear about every day, nor did we want to write about every day, we started transitioning into a show that brought you some vital information on news topics, but chased that with more uplifting news. New discoveries, scientific breakthroughs, weird findings from history, life hacks for self-improvement, internet trends, and more. I often said it was stuff that could remind you that, despite an ongoing pandemic and the other horrors of the day, the world is still spinning, and people everywhere are still creating and discovering fascinating new things. I've often leaned hard into space news because, one, I just think it's cool, and two, because nothing to me evokes the idea of the world still spinning more than literally being able to see the entire world from up there in space. And last Friday, we hit another milestone when the second commercial crew program spacecraft finally launched from Cape Canaveral in Florida and successfully docked with the International Space Station a day later. Pending a successful return to Earth on Wednesday, Boeing will become only the second private company to join the elite class of companies eligible to fly NASA astronauts to the ISS. Now, while the launch was ultimately successful, it did not go off without a hitch. Quoting the Washington Post, The docking was delayed after a problem with the mechanism Starliner uses to dock with the station forced controllers to retract the system and then extend it a second time to reset it. On the way to the station, two of Starliner's 12 main thrusters failed shortly after launch, and the spacecraft's temperature control system also malfunctioned. But neither problem prevented the docking, and the thrusters performed well during maneuvers since the launch put it into position for the docking. Boeing also said it was continuing to monitor problems with the thermal control system, which is designed to keep the capsule's systems at the right temperature as it flies through the vacuum of space. Spokesman Steve Sisoloff said during a live broadcast of the docking that the company had been able to overcome the problem by making manual adjustments to the cooling system that would normally be automated. End quote. All were issues that were resolved, and Sisoloff referred to it as, quote, part of the learning process for operating Starliner in orbit. End quote. Which is literally, by definition, what the exercise was. Although Starliner also carried hundreds of pounds of cargo to the ISS, this was technically an uncrewed orbital test flight, meant to test everything that they need to iron out before their first crewed flight potentially later this year. Between facing so many delays with the Starliner over the years, as well as delays on some of their parts of the long-hyped and uber-expensive space launch system, Boeing has started earning a bit of a reputation for being cumbersome, especially when compared to SpaceX, who has successfully taken four crews of NASA astronauts to the ISS after being awarded their commercial crew contract at the same time as Boeing in 2014. I don't know how fair the critiques of Boeing always are, though, and I was pretty stoked to see this launch finally happen. And if you want to watch the Starliner capsule return on Wednesday, NASA will be live-streaming it starting at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern when it undocks from the ISS. They will end that stream and start up a new one at 5.45 p.m. Eastern to catch up with the capsule as it begins its deorbit burn and lands in New Mexico just before 7. Link to the streams are in the show notes. Coca-Cola is trying to prevent how many of their soda caps end up as litter around the world by introducing a new design to their plastic bottles in which the caps are tethered to the bottle. The new design is so far only being rolled out in the United Kingdom, where all plastic bottles of Coke, Coke Zero, Diet Coke, Fanta, Sprite, and Dr. Pepper will have these attached caps by early 2024. From mock-up images, the cap looks pretty close to how they currently do, but it stays on the bottom plastic ring, so it appears to still twist off, not like flip open, 
but it looks like it flips open. I'm not entirely sure of the mechanics here. You can see a picture for yourself at the CNN link in the show notes. And even though this is a move being taken by a corporation, it still kind of feels like one of those cases of blaming individuals' behavior for the climate emergency and not the outsized impact of corporations, especially because the press release makes a point of saying that their bottle caps have been 100% recyclable for years, but people don't always recycle them. So now they've made a bottle that forces people to recycle the caps. You know, if they're even recycling the whole bottle to begin with. I suppose it's a cool thought, and it'll probably help a little, but many people are already accusing it of being greenwashing. TechCrunch points out how the UK, where these tethered bottle caps are being introduced, has a pretty bad track record when it comes to recycling. Quote, In the rest of Europe, Coca-Cola and other drink manufacturers figured out a functioning system. Pay a deposit when you buy a bottle or aluminum can, and you get a deposit back when you return it. It works. In Norway, for example, in 2018, the return ratio of reusable bottles was 95%, and aluminum cans were returned in upwards of 98% of all cases. After being returned, the packaging is reused in some cases or recycled in others. There's a bigger reliance on plastic bottles that are sturdy enough that they can be reused 20 times before they're recycled. And beer often comes in reusable glass bottles that are actually reused by the breweries, rather than having to melt and remake the bottles after a single use. In the U.S., in contrast, not only are the bottles not reused, less than 30% of bottles are even recycled, the rest goes to landfill. In the United Kingdom, where Coca-Cola is patting itself on the back about its cap-connecting prowess, the number is around 45%, end quote. So less than half of bottles, tethered cap or no, will be recycled anyways. Seems like taking steps to encourage more recycling or reusing might have a bigger impact. Graham Forbes from Greenpeace told CNN, quote, Whether their plastic caps are tethered or not, the company still produces billions of throwaway plastic bottles every year, harming our environment, our communities, and our climate, and impacting our health. If they truly want to solve the plastic and climate crisis, Coca-Cola must focus on reducing plastic by doubling its reuse and refill packaging target to 50% by 20 End quote. Now, Coke is making some efforts with their World Without Waste initiative, which, quoting CNN, lays out a 2030 goal of helping to collect and recycle empty bottles or cans for each one the company sells. It also plans to make its cans and bottles with 50% recycled material by 2030 and to make packaging 100% recyclable by 2025. End quote. So I think they know that tethered bottle caps aren't going to save the world alone, but it is always a little annoying to see corporations pat themselves on the back for small steps while ignoring some of the big elephants in the room. Well, that was a Mondo episode for you. I didn't want to make it all about monkeypox, but the trade-off was that the whole thing ended up being quite long. If you're still listening here at the end, thanks. I'll try to keep it a bit lighter tomorrow, but, you know, like Boeing, no promises. This show was produced by Ride Home Media. I'm Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.